Thank you so much for being here today to celebrate our achievements and also to witness this moment that marks our launch into the new world. My name is Minyoung Kim and it is my great honor to be here today as a class representative and to be a small part of the journey we have shared here at LaGuardia Community College. Today, I want to emphasize the value of our education and the impact it can have on not only our lives, but also on the world around us. LaGuardia helped me realize my potential and visualize a future that I didn't know existed to me before. I don't even recognize the person who I was when I first started at LaGuardia two years ago. I'm from Seoul, South Korea, a place etched in my heart, but my academic journey, a winding, a turbulent road, took me far from home. At the age of 16, I was at a crossroad and chose to leave high school. What followed was nearly a decade exploring myself and searching for the right education. I moved to the United States and tried out other few colleges, both in New York City and in Texas. I've delved into different majors, both um, searching for the spark that will reignite my passion and purpose in life. This meandering journey led me to the doors of LaGuardia, an institution renowned for its excellence in STEM and commitment to cultivating opportunities for students. The reputation of this institution was not a mere echo, but a resonant symphony of dedicated educator, inspiring mentors, and supported peers. As a student at LaGuardia and a student success mentor, I met numerous fellow non-traditional students, immigrant students like myself or my friends from Russia, Philippines, Iran, Bangladesh, Puerto Rico, and Haiti. We felt challenged sometimes, but we stuck it out together and made it this far. We inspired each other with our perseverance and our own persistence. I learned from them and from you that our struggles and hardship is what shape us into who we are today. LaGuardia provided us with the community where we could embrace our individual uniqueness and where we grew together, standing in unity, supporting each other. LaGuardia also gave me opportunities I didn't think was possible for me. I wanna thank Dr. Daropse, Dr. Ye, and CUNY Research Scholars Program Directors, Dr. Hosanna and Dr. Senkov for mentoring starting researchers like myself because the world is desperately in need of scientists with new ideas and unwavering commitment to humanity. <laughs> LaGuardia is a place to meet hundreds of people who are encouraging and genuinely rooting for your success and well-being. A heartfelt thank you to Christopher, uh, Dr. Christopher Smith and Dr. Drame, who not only believed in me and my classmates, but also nurtured our potential and showed us genuine compassion. My deepest gratitude also extends to the President Society, a fertile ground for my personal and professional development and my fellows. LaGuardia gave me such feelings of belonging where I was thousands of miles away from where I grew up. And it became my home for the last two years and I'm sure it was for most of us, if not for everyone. My favorite thing about LaGuardia is that we all had each other's back and continue to inspire each other. We witnessed what seemed impossible become possible and we watched faculty and staff agonize over how to improve our experience here at LaGuardia. Dearest Dr. Koh once said, successes do not happen in a vacuum or in isolation, but emerge from an ecosystem of support and connection across from different offices, programs, and departments. The dedication and commitment to our education have made a significant impact on our experiences. Today, as we stand on the brink of our future, let us carry forward the spirit of collaboration and determination we have fostered here at LaGuardia Community College. Together, we can create a future that is brighter and more inclusive for all. 
I want to extend my gratitude to my parents and my sister who travel from Seoul to be here with me today. Kim Yeonhyuk Si, Jang Dok Ki Si, Kim Min Ki Si, Jonggyung Hako, 사랑합니다. Thank you once again for this um, incredible honor and congratulations to the class of 2023. I'm privileged to give about 10 graduation speeches a year, five mid-year and five at the end of the year. But every single time I'm called to do this, I'm full. When I get to the stage, I'm full. By the time the graduates start walking down the aisle, because I am you and you are me. You're my sons, my daughters, my sisters, perhaps mothers and grandmothers, fathers. We are one. And I'm just humbled and privileged to be here. I, I greet you in the name of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu speaks to our interconnectivity. I am because you are, you are because I am, and we are one. And it's in that spirit that I will share words with you. And then as you continue your walk, I will walk with and for you. I'm honored to be here. And it's good to be back in central Brooklyn and its surrounding areas. I grew up in Montclair, New Jersey, just across the bridge. And when I felt as I was grown, I got on the bus and came on into Brooklyn. I went to Junior's and last night as Officer Silva was driving me to the hotel. I went past Junior's and I think that has the all time best cheesecake. And I see that it's still standing. I also used to go down to Canal Street from Montclair, New Jersey when I was 14, 15, and, and we knew that we were coming to get some precious designer goods, some handbags with other people's names on it that would fall apart in a matter of months, and some precious jewelry that would turn our fingers green. But more in line with my spirit and my calling, when I was a second and third year student at Douglas College, Rutgers University, I used to come to drive into, uh, into Brooklyn. And on Flatbush Avenue, I stood up um, food centers. I, I stood up uh, fresh fruits and vegetables for the community three days a week. And I was privileged to come and work and engage with the community, so coming back was tremendous. But when I came, when I was in Douglas, I didn't have any transportation, and my sociology teacher, who gave me this as an externship, had mercy on me, because I was taking the train and the bus and going home at, late at night, and he let me use his red convertible Corvette to get here. And so I was not just coming three days a week, I was coming every chance I could to get in to New York. Glad to be back and glad to be with you here today. Your journey will shift when you receive your final piece of paper, among so many that you received from Medgar Evers, a paper diploma or a paper certificate, you will receive that today. And it will be perhaps the most important piece of paper you'll receive. I'll talk to you about that quickly then I'll sit down. But I want to talk about your parents and I want you to say something about them. Today is National Parent Day, if you did not know it. Today is National Parent Day. And so whether it was National Parent Day or not, I would ask you students to rise if you're able and to thank your parents and parent-like figures. Stand if you are able and thank your parents now. Thank you. Thank you, parents. Thank you, parent-like figures. I thank every parent and every parent-like figure here today on behalf of your graduate. Thank you. 
I thank you parents and parent-like figures for your untold sacrifices and challenges. I thank you parents and parent-like figures for the things that you went through to get your students here to this high point in our collective journeys. It probably feels like yesterday when they were born, when they first said your name, when they took their first steps, when they graduated high school, when they had their first broken heart and you held them tight, you mended and lifted them and so much more. You remember the personal, perhaps the financial, and certainly the emotional sacrifices you made to get them to this point in their journey. But parents and parent-like figures, what you learned by the time you got your student to this point and what the students have learned is they are fulfilling their purpose with meaning and a powerful spark of energy that is unique to all of our sons and daughters. Each has overcome obstacles, taken risks, and continued to trust the journey. Many have discovered by getting to this point that life is about the journey, not the destination. Life is about the journey, not the destination, and you cannot sit it out. It's destined to be long or short or somewhere in it, but in, most importantly, it's destined to be bumpy. But if you stay focused and you walk deliberately and collaboratively, if you focus not on success, but on the significance of your moves, you will realize an, a distinguished journey. And I want to tell you a bit about the journey. You heard already from President Ramsey and some others, and you lived through the journey of COVID and what that did to your plans. You lived through that, and you heard about it, you know about it. But as you get ready to receive your final paper from Medgar Evers and move beyond this to your next journey, you're walking into a challenging environment. You're walking into a nation which is spiraling downward. It's in moral decay, unraveling. Many of the hard-won economic and civil rights battles like those Medgar Evers led to end discrimination, to end voter suppression, and the like. Today, as you in the graduating class of 2023 move out into the world and receive your diploma, it's incumbent upon you not just to pick up your diploma, but pick up the mantle, the mantle that Medgar Evers and his wife, Merrill Lee, who is also a Justice Janissary, and commit to do whatever it is that aligns your passion with your profession, but most especially commit to continuing the work of a Justice Janissary. You must continue the work that Medgar Evers began. It is the cost you must pay for your time of the stay here at Medgar Evers. If you don't choose to, to engage in the battles to reverse the unraveling of voting rights, raise your voice and, and, and raise votes on other things important to you. The debt ceiling legislation is being negotiated right now. And Trustee Clark talked about Hakeem Jeffries. You know Hakeem Jeffries. It is because of Congressman Jeffries that a vote to continue the ceiling and not cut off all the funds was had today. And one of you in this room can do and should do the same thing. Use your new skills, your understandings, and your sensitivities for taxation and spending policies, for environmental and economic justice, for women's choice, whatever is your passion. To make transformative or revolutionary change, you've got to collaborate. 
You've got to engage in strategic hard work, focused affirmative results, and trust the, pos the process. What I want to suggest to you more clearly is that whatever you do next, it's not about where you land, where you end, it's about the journey. Engage wholeheartedly in the journey, trust the journey, and for sure, you'll stumble, you'll fall. There are curves in the journey called failure. There are loops in the journey called confusion. There are speed bumps called friends, caution lights called family. You'll even have flats called life, caution life, caution lights called families. But I'm here to tell you that if you have a spare called determination, an engine called perseverance, insurance called faith, and a driver called Jesus, Allah, Jehovah, Hashem, Adonai, Buddha, the Almighty, the Sparrow, or whatever you call your creator, if you accept finite disappointments along your journey and never lose hope, you will make it to success, a place of love, a place of justice, interconnectivity, interdependence, peace, abundance, and joy, where no one is above another, and each man your brother, each woman your sister. Your journey will have highs and lows. The way you deal with them will most assuredly determine your success, the road. And I want to tell you just a minute about my journey. I, I told you already, I grew up in Montclair across the river. I, I worked hard, worked three jobs to put myself through undergrad, had no debt when I got out, worked three jobs to put myself through law school, had no debt when I got out. But that's not the point. As I was reaching the end of my second year in law school, my body began to fail me. I spent the rest of the semester going to specialists, doctors. My skin began falling off. My hair fell out. I couldn't move any of my extremities. I could drive my car to the back of Howard University Law School and the parking attendant, HU, and the parking attendant would assist me into the building. As I was poised to take my exams second, at the end of the second semester, I couldn't bend my fingers. I could not finish. I excused myself and drove myself home. When I got to my apartment, tried to put the key in the door, and I could not. I fell. I fell into the hall. Fortunately, a doctor in the building got me did CPR. I was in a coma for the next six months, and my life's dream since I was 14 years old was to be a justice janissary. And so I was in a coma. My neighbor, CPR, six weeks in the coma. I came out of that. I was blind and paralyzed from the waist down for six months. Now, that was interfering with my plan. I was on a journey that if you work hard, and I worked hard, Trustee Clark, I worked hard, three jobs to get out of there. But this was a bump in the road I did not anticipate. When I came out of the coma and I was still paralyzed and blind, I said to my mentor, I've always wanted to be a justice janissary. If I can't run to the courts, if I can't get into the streets, into the trenches with the people who need it most, I don't want to be a lawyer. In fact, I don't want to live. And this was a distinguished professor of constitutional law at Howard University, and he said, you've got to live. You're too important to the phalanx of lawyers. We need more justice, Janice. We need more Harvard folks. We need more people who come from Medgar Evers College and go into law as justice Janissaries. But he did something else. The six months that I was in school, in the, I'm sorry, in, in the hospital, blind and paralyzed, he had every professor, five professors in law school, come to my bedside. And everything they taught in the class, they taught to me. They had to read it to me. We engaged in Socratic method and thereby permitting me to graduate with my class, not only with my class, but at the top of my class. Howard University. Now, that's important in a lesson because 
Howard University believed in me like Medgar Evers believes in you. Medgar Evers will not let you fall and leave you there. Medgar Evers has picked you up every time you stumbled. And if you get a major life-altering challenge, Medgar Evers would be there. But the other thing, the final thing I want to talk about this, and I'm going to shift, I promise, I promise, is my mentor was the lawyer for the National Association for Equal Opportunity in Higher Ed. I didn't know anything about a group of 106 historically black colleges, a group of 80 predominantly black institutions, including Medgar Evers. I did not know about it. And when the five professors that came to my bed every day got me out of there, although I was home blind and paralyzed for additional months, I said, what can I do to pay you? I have no money. I had hospital bills I couldn't pay. I was going to negotiate that out, but what can I do? And he said, spend the rest of your life making sure that HBCUs and PBIs, Medgar Evers College is strong. Make sure it's strong and work. Work when they can pay you, but when they can't, work pro bono. And I've now spent more than 30 years doing that. It's my love, it's my passion. And so you must find your love. You must find your passion and meld your passion and your profession. When you meld your passion and your profession, you'll still stumble and things will be dark. But whenever you're at the darkest point, look for the light. And when you find the light, you'll find justice. You'll find a new opportunity to move forward. This is the beginning of the rest of your life. I pray, I hope, I urge emphatically that you do whatever is your passion, but you've got to do something to continue Medgar Evers' dream. Focus on the journey. The success is in the journey. Thank you so very much for this time this morning. The class of 2023 is a student body diverse in culture, religion, academic interests, and age, but we share a common goal our desire for educational advancement. We embarked on this journey to increase our career stability and satisfaction, discover ourselves, be better able to provide for our families, and make an impact on our communities. In my home country, there's an old proverb, and my mother always said it to me. If you're Jamaican or of Jamaican descent, You've probably heard it before. One, one cocoa, full basket. <laughs> Essentially, based on today's context, it means that every step contributes to achieving your goal. Well, you did it. We did it. For some of us, we have completed the final degree. Congratulations. For some of us, another step in a long, long, long career path. But still, congratulations. My goal today is to remind, to encourage you, to celebrate all your achievements, big or small. Every accomplishment you achieve is vital in preparing you for your final step. I was always so focused on getting to the next step or the final destination that I never really appreciated the lessons, values, or skills I learned. Enrolling in community college after a three-year break was a hard decision for me to make. Blinded by the stigma surrounding such institutions, I felt embarrassed to tell anyone. I had also convinced myself I was behind, as all my friends and classmates were in their final year of college getting ready to receive their bachelors. I can stand here today and tell you that becoming a Panther is a decision I do not regret. The BMCC community has offered me more than I could ever give back. 
I have grown in numerous ways and had a necessary milestone I call my BMCC moment. I discovered my desire to pursue maternal fetal medicine after writing a research paper on the maternal morbidity and mortality rate of black women in America. And that was for an English 101 class, not a science class. <laughs> I presented that research again in my Speech 100 class, which resulted in me finally having a deep connection to medicine, changing my career trajectory. I am sure my fellow graduates can relate to a BMCC moment of their own, a moment you will look back on and consider a vital step in your life or career that is an essential cocoa in your basket. The Borough of Manhattan Community College has taught us to use our undergraduate years as a phase of exploration and a time to exercise our curiosity and discover new interests and abilities to achieve a balance of depth and breadth. We have aspired to learn how to ask big questions rather than think exclusively about satisfying course requirements, developing a rich awareness of our heritage, to lead and serve in every sphere of human activity. As we complete our associates and begin our next step, our time at BMCC has prepared us for success and endless possibilities exist. The Borough, of Manhattan, the Borough of Manhattan Community College is the definition of start here, go anywhere, and everyone sitting here today is living proof. On behalf of the class of 2023, to our professors who have nurtured our minds, our support systems on campus, and our family and friends here today and at home. Thank you. I want to thank Jesus for his grace and for blessing me in ways I've never dreamt of. <laughs> thank you, Professor Goslau, Professor Johnstone, Professor Polite, and Professor Lorio. To my BMCC families that provided me with all the support and resources I needed, my family at ASAP, my family at UMLA, and my family at IMPACT, thank you. Most importantly, to the family I call home. Mommy, your support and guidance means the world to me, even when we disagree. I love you and big up yourself. <laughs> Class of 2023, we have achieved this victory together. We are the next generation of alums that makes us family. So today, I want to encourage each of my fellow graduates to look around and see how far you've come. You have completed another step up your academic ladder. You have added yet another cocoa to your basket. Revel and live in this moment. Remember this, do not deprive yourself of an exciting journey because you are too focused on getting to the finish line. It is not the final step that gets you there. Every step you took before brought you to that moment to take your final step to victory. Thank you. Once upon a time, there was a four-year-old girl with braids whose grandmother believed so much in her talents that she took her to the local conservatory and convinced the teachers to begin her music education. My entire family was involved in this undertaking. I was a member of a lower income family in Cuba 
that dreamt for their child to attain a college education. What we lacked in material wealth, we made up in spirit, encouragement, and support. When I was nine years old, I told my family that my dream was to go to Paris, study at the Paris Conservatory, and build a career as a concert pianist. However, a twist of fate determined that I would arrive in the United States in my early 20s, armed with a cardboard suitcase, suitcase a head full of dreams, and three English words. Yes, no, and Maria. <laughs> when friends picked me up from the airport, we drove to their home in the Bronx and passed many apartment buildings with fire escapes, prompting me to shout, Maria, Maria, Maria. <laughs> I understand that Maria is not exactly an English word, but to me, at that moment, it was. I recognized those buildings, the fire escapes from West Side Story, from a clip of the movie I had seen in my home in Havana, Cuba. These were the fire escapes on which Maria was standing when Tony sang to her from the street below. It so happens that years later, I had the opportunity to tell that story to Leonard Bernstein, the composer of West Side Story, while I was studying with him at the Tanglewood Music Center. I remember his reaction. He laughed so hard and so loud. I still recall that moment. Within a year of my arrival in this country, a classmate of mine at NYU, Laura Wilson, who was working as a piano accompanist for ballet lessons at the Harlem School of the Arts, asked me to replace her one day when she was sick. I excitedly took a train to Harlem for the very first in my life, first time in my life, unaware that my destiny was about to take a dramatic turn. Arthur Mitchell was there, the first principal dancer of New York City Ballet, looking for a studio to teach his dancers and initiate a project he had in mind. Within months, that project would materialize as the Dance Theater of Harlem, of which I became a founding member as pianist and then music director. <laughs> I did not know that joining Dance Theater of Harlem would also result in my becoming a composer with the opportunities therein. New York University was the educational institution from which I later graduated as a composition major. Another turn of fate came in the 1980s when I was appointed as a professor of composition at Brooklyn College of the City University of New York. My life in Brooklyn College, where I taught for 33 years in the music department, eventually becoming a distinguished professor, has been the source of enriching experiences, personal growth, and many talented students and personal friends, which have become members of my extended family. Many of these colleagues and students have been inspirational through their passion and their contributions to society. To see students graduate is a joyful moment for all of the professors involved in their journey, including myself. My journey to where I am standing before you today has been blessed by the spirit, encouragement, and support not only of my family, but of teachers, mentors, colleagues, neighbors, friends, audiences, and well-wishers. They have been there for me in the good times, and in the not so good times. I am not standing here alone. Beside me and behind me, though you cannot see them, are the invisible spirits that have helped me reach the dreams that my family aspire for their little girl. Today, as I receive this honorary doctoral degree, I reflect on the memory of those that have touched and continue to touch my life profoundly. 
On this day of your commencement, each one of you is embarking on a new journey. Each one of you is a dream of a grandmother, a grandfather, a mother, a father, a family, professors, mentors. They have walked with you along the way. They have walked with you to this point. You are yourself becoming professionals, teachers, mentors, parents, family, threads in the fabric of our humanity. As you continue on your journey and give service to our societies with your unique talents, you in turn will offer your support, encouragement, and powerful spirit that will help others realize their dreams. Thank you, class of 2023. I salute your success with great joy. <laughs> Gracias, clase de 2023. Yo celebro vuestros éxitos con gran satisfacción. Your career exemplifies the humanity, cultural depth, and sense of social justice that we value in our graduates and our public figures and represents this university's highest values. By the authority vested in the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York, by the State of New York, and by them entrusted to me, I hereby confer upon Steve Phillips the degree of humane letters, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges, immunities, and honors pertaining thereof. For me personally, this is a bittersweet occasion. On the one hand, I'm deeply moved by the honorary doctorate, and I want to shout out my father, actual medical doctor, James Phillips. Dad, you're not the only doctor in the family anymore. But for the rest of my family, don't call me for medical advice. But as happy as this day is, the sad truth is that I'm also here without my life partner, Susan Sandler, who completed her journey on this earth in December after living for six years and three months with cancer. As I've tried to process my grief and chart my way forward, I've turned to art and culture for inspiration. And I recently came across a painting by Barbara Jones Hogu that captured my imagination. The painting is called Rise and Take Control, and it is inspired by the epic 1942 Margaret Walker poem, For My People, which ends with the words, rise and take control. While I hadn't actually thought about that poem in decades since I was in college, the words came immediately rushing back to me. For my people everywhere, singing their slave songs repeatedly, their dirges and their ditties and their blues and jubilees. For my people, washing, ironing, cooking, scrubbing, sewing, mending, hoeing, plowing, digging, planting, pruning, patching, dragging along, never gaining, never reaping, never knowing, and never understanding. For my people, standing, staring, trying to fashion a world that will hold all the people, all the faces. Let a new earth rise. Let another world be born. Let the martial songs be written. Let the dirges disappear. Let my people now rise and take control. We need you to rise and take control because we are still engaged in a civil war in this country. It's not something that's pleasant to acknowledge, and other institutions of higher education may gloss over this reality and fail to summon their graduates to action. But the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies has asked the author of a book called How We Win the Civil War to be its commencement speaker and to share a few words of inspiration. To be clear, I'm not calling for conflict. I am here to sound the alarm that the Confederates and their ideological descendants have never stopped fighting. 
from the assassination of Abraham Lincoln five days after the supposed surrender at Appomattox, to the hayes tilden Compromise 12 years later, where Georgia Senator John Brown Gordon brokered the deal that resulted in handing control of the southern states back to the Confederates for nearly 100 years, to the January 6, 2021 insurrection, where people carrying the Confederate flag and wearing sweatshirts saying MAGA Civil War stormed the United States Capitol in an effort to stop the peaceful transfer of power. This ongoing civil war impedes progress on nearly every meaningful public policy issue, from ending poverty to reproductive rights to ending a global pandemic to combating climate change. The good news is that this is a struggle that we can and should win, because those of us who want this country to be a multiracial democracy are the majority of people. That's why the Confederates are so focused on trying to stop us from voting. So what does rising and taking control look like? Who can we emulate in that quest? Rising and taking control looks like Dolores Huerta, joining with her sisters and brothers, picking grapes under a sweltering sun to form a strong farm workers union that combined the labor struggle with the racial justice struggle of Latinos and Filipinos into a movement powerful enough to compel multinational corporations to share the wealth with the people who created that wealth in the first place. Rising and taking control looks like Dolores working with Cesar Chavez to establish a union headquarters in the mountains of California, where an Arizona teenager named John Laredo would go to learn at the knee of the organizing greats and then take that knowledge back to Arizona, where he helped catalyze the coalition that registered half a million people of color to vote in a manifestation of the power that Jesse Jackson used to talk about when he said the hands that once picked cotton and grapes can now pick presidents. And those new voters in Arizona turned out in historic numbers to elect Joe Biden. And on his first day as president, Biden placed the bust of Cesar Chavez in the Oval Office. Rising and taking, and taking control looks like Stacey Abrams scanning the landscape in Georgia 10 years ago and seeing that there are 1.5 million unregistered people of color and coming to me and my wife to tell us that she was going to register them to vote. And over the course of a decade, Stacey led the work of bringing souls to the polls in sufficiently large numbers that Georgia flipped control of the entire United States Congress by electing to the Senate Reverend Raphael Warnock, the literal successor to Martin Luther King Jr. <clears throat> Senator Warnock now holds the same Senate seat that was held by John Brown Gordon when he orchestrated the overthrow of Reconstruction in 1877. <clears throat> Rising and taking control looks like Deepak Bhargava, graduating from college and turning down lucrative job offers to go do the work of organizing immigrants and poor people into a powerful political movement where he pushed the White House and top congressional leaders to advance economic justice policies. And it looks like Deepak becoming a distinguished lecturer and helping to create a leadership program at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. And it also looks like Deepak demonstrating solidarity forever as he takes those values with him as he ascends to the highest levels of philanthropy in this country. <laughs> Rising and taking control is also about people and not just power. It's about prioritizing relationships and showing up and being there for one another. It's the kind of thing that Deepak did. He made the time to call my wife every single Friday at 5 o'clock for the last year of her life. It's the kind of example set by Carol Tolan, a progressive white woman from New York, who not only donated money to Stacey Abrams' work long before Stacey became famous, but after Stacey fell agonizingly short in 2018, Carol sent her flowers every week for two years to show that she cared about her and was thinking of her. Lastly, well, this is an exciting moment. It can also be scary to head out into the world, tackle new challenges, to rise to new levels of responsibility. 
Skepticism about our talent and intellect is particularly projected onto working people and people of color. But I have been blessed in my life to move in many circles. The President of the United States has been to my house. I've been to the White House. I've sat on boards and worked closely with corporate titans, billionaires, and heads of Fortune 500 companies. And I am telling you for a fact that you are just as smart and talented, if not smarter, than all of these people. <laughs> Because ultimately, how can you run a company or a country in a society whose population is 41% people of color if you've never been in a black barbershop or beauty salon, danced at a quinceanera, you don't even know where Chinatown is? <laughs> for my people everywhere, for my people thronging 47th Street in Chicago and Lenox Avenue in New York, for my people trying to fashion a world that will hold all the people, all the faces. Graduates, the world is waiting for you and desperately needs you to rise and take control. <laughs>
Professor Posey encouraged me to put myself out there for scholarships, fellowships, and grants. Due in part to her influence, yesterday I got to ferry home five student awards. You. you don't have to clap, but it's nice that you did. Being validated for my achievements in this way has fundamentally changed the way that I view myself as a student. Kingsborough encouraged me to dream about the future again, and I dream big, from a bachelor's degree to a doctorate to my own clinical practice. All of this requires many more years in academia, but that idea no longer fills me with dread. Instead, I am incredibly excited for the future of research and learning and growing that I have in front of me. The person that I am today, full of joy and passion and confident in my place here, would be unrecognizable to who I was in high school. I truly became myself at Kingsborough. My passion for mental health advocacy led me down this path, and I know that it will end with me spending each day helping others transform themselves in the same way that I did. But the people here helped me light the way. And as influential as Kingsborough has been in my journey, I also want to take a moment to thank the people at home who helped me carry the torch. So thank you, Mom and Dad, for keeping faith in me when I had none in myself. It was hard and scary for so long, but you always knew that I had this in me. I'm so glad I can finally prove you right. And thank you to my partner, Parley, for holding my flashcards, weathering each and every pre-final breakdown, and bragging more about my accomplishments than his own. To my fellow graduates, I know that my story is not unique among you. Every single one of you has overcome your own hardships in order to be here. Some of us had our educations disrupted by COVID. Some of us did drop out of high school. Some of us are veterans or parents or returning learners. I wish that I had two more years with all of you to learn about your individual journeys. But what I can tell you is this. The fact that you are standing here today is a triumph. Nobody is here because their path has been without obstacles. But you showed up. You did the work. In a world that is all too eager to discount students that don't follow the traditional path, you refuse to give up on yourselves. Whatever you do, wherever you go, keep that fire. Keep that faith. Take it from someone who cannot get those years back. Do not waste time worrying if you are strong enough or smart enough or good enough. You made it here. You are alive and you are doing your best. You are enough. Your drive to succeed will carry you further than you ever thought possible. I know that in a college environment, we all got accustomed to the pass-fail dichotomy. When you cross Oriental Boulevard for the final time after you leave today, leave that in the classroom. In your life after Kingsborough, you will reach yet more obstacles. You will face challenges. And sometimes there will be setbacks. Do not consider these moments failures. And do not allow them to dim your light. Take them as an opportunity to learn, to grow, and to become the kind of person who can get back up and push through. Remember that no time spent improving or recovering is ever wasted. The time will pass anyway, and you will be stronger for it. The journey never ends. It just takes a detour every once in a while. On that note, I want to leave you with a line from Tony Hoagland's poem, Memory is a Hearing Aid, which my partner shared with me when I was limping through my senior year, and I've held dearly to my chest in all the difficult moments since. I can almost hear the future whisper to the past. It says that this is not a test and everyone passes. 
The tests are over. It's been an honor to pass with you. Congratulations, class of 2023.